Marcelo Espina is founder and principal of Patents. Marcelo received his BARC from Na the National University of Rosario, Argentina, and MARC from Columbia University, New York. He has won numerous awards, which I'm not going to list. He is the co-author of Embedded, Material Beyond Materials, and the forthcoming New Icons publication. He also the, was the co-curator of Matters of Sensation at Artist Space. Marcelo Spina is the Architectural Technologies Coordinator at SciArc, where he has been teaching since 2001. Marcelo has been a visiting professor at Yale, Syracuse, Harvard, Berkeley, and Dietilla, among others. Marcelo has given more than 100 lectures around the world, so he has heard many introductions. However, I'm still going to attempt to introduce him at a personal level. Here, typology is not safe. Ornament has been reinvented. The mute is forced to talk. Material always has an intention. Tectonics are revealed, and form follows no instruction. Drawings reflect the facts, while buildings live in the fiction. Challenging architecture is Marcelo's strongest weapon, and with that, I would like to begin our conversation. Marcelo, thank you for sitting down with me today. Thank you. Cool. Um, what do you believe was your starting point, your first architectural project? Well, first, let me say, I mean, the, the, everything we do here at Patterns, is, so it's a collaboration between Georgino Hitch, who is my partner, and almost since the beginning of the office, and, and myself, and you know, a bunch of people, including Daniela Tencio recently, who's playing an important role in the, in the office, and Dylan Kruger. Um, so, back to your question about the first project. I don't know, I mean, I, I think there are different sort of generations. I could go back to the first sort of ever commission after I finished uh, school in Argentina, uh, which was a, you know, a single family house. And it was a serious commission, and it was an important thing for me to like, uh, you know, try and take on. I think as a practice, probably uh, FYF House in Argentina was really a kind of a starting point of of, um, of, of patterns in a, you know in with a project that kind of translated to the built environment. Uh, with an actual building, you know, we've done installations and, and buildings of a different scale before, but that sort of translated many of the assumptions associated with, you know, digital technology, with certain ways of working, with certain ways of uh, or incorporating uh, moments of inflection, curvature in association with straight lines, uh, you know, translate all those sort of sensibilities into actual build work. And so that actually was a, you know, that was probably the most significant project, you know, in the, in the first one, in the beginning one. That's a perfect segue to the next question, which is you belong to the digital generation. However, you are always moving towards material form. So what was the importance of building right from the beginning for you? Because this office has built and it continues to build. You know, I come from a family of builders and my father had a construction company, uh, mm -hmm. small um, got to be actually relatively large, so building was sort of in the family. Uh, my view to building was never really a, an interest in building per se, but more like imagining buildings, uh, designing buildings, and then for somebody else to build. But building didn't seem unattainable because it was kind of in the family. Uh, I don't know, it seems like sort of a logical point in architecture and, and in design, you know, but I never saw building in itself as a kind of, uh, as a sort of end in and of itself. You know, there needed to be an idea, there needed to be a concept, there needed to be something worth building. Uh, but the same way, I never thought that, you know, uh, I, I would have never been content with just the idea of imagining something and not caring whether or not it was actually going to get built. Uh, so we always try to actually build, we always thought, you know, uh, we always think and design uh, thinking of building in a way uh, as a kind of final goal. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, but, uh, so we always thought that, you know, that, that digital, uh, tools or digital work or the kind of whole digital generation was really interesting because, you know, we, we were part of it and I was educated and there, you know, people like Jesse and, and, but I was never, 
I don't know. I was never really content with the idea that that, that in itself became a problem. I mean, for us, the problem was always trying to do to have a project and to do a great project, you know, meaning a project as a kind of larger thing, and then projects, you know, and sort of individual responses to actual problems. Uh, and in that sense, you know, building was sort of a logical step to try to test things and to make things more kind of available in a sort of in, in the uh, in the built environment, let's say. And you are very involved in academia and you're practicing. So there's a tension in academia if you're too focused on building, and then there's a tension in the built practice world where if you're involved in academia. So what tensions does that create? Because you have a pretty good balance of both. I mean, it does create a lot of tension. I think, again, I always, I've been interested in academia since I was a student in Argentina. I was interested in teaching. I saw it as a way of like, uh, Pursuing new ideas and testing new ideas and 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 being involved also in the kind of you know in, in, in producing sort of pedagogy, uh, but it does create a kind of friction with the work because the academia, especially certain places like Sire, move at a different pace than in practice moves, and those two paces at some point become uh, you know potentially contradictory to each other, and so. Academia has a sort of some laws and 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 and, and rules and somehow and uh, than the practice have and I think you know we try to kind of um, understand those. However, we couldn't do the work we do without actually being associated to academia. You know, like I'm, my work at SciArc, Shoshina's work at UCLA, it's fundamental to our to our work. You know, we're always like feeding back and forth from from it. Uh, in the last maybe two or three years. We try and keep a little bit more distance and, um, I mean, as much as we can from academia, uh, assuming that certain decisions we make in academia will be entirely academic based and some of that research will, might never come to the practice. Uh, uh, but also, you know, infusing maybe more and more some studios with certain, um, actual problems and, and, and issues that really come from the sort of you know, from, from the professional side of things, uh, assuming that those things is well positioned, could actually constitute a stronger pedagogy and become part of the discipline in some way. Um, erasing or challenging typologies is something that belongs to you in a unique way. You've always tried to make sure that the buildings don't really reflect what their function is or their actual typology. So what's the importance of challenging the perception? Of what the building is, I, I think it's important. Well, I mean, first of all, typology is an important word, you know. I mean, and it sort of has kind of evolved over history, you know, since the, I mean, since like early age, you know, uh, ideas of what the typology as a sort of rough question of, uh, you know, a sort of rough armature framework for building to the sort of more like Russian idea of typology as a much more fixed condition. And I mean, we believe in typologies as somewhat kind of in between, let's say, uh, meaning we, we look at typologies as, let's say, you know, horizontal slab or, or a bar building or a tower, really basic things, but understanding that over history, there's certain transgressions, certain combination, evolution of typology. Uh, but typology always stays relevant for some reason, means like certain things are inescapable. Um, so we like to actually operate within that sort of framework to actually know where we can push things and know where the conventions are and accept them right from the start so we can actually be closer to them and, and therefore hopefully try to either uh, further or innovate them. Uh, what... Um, I forgot the question exactly, but the, the I mean, the idea of challenging uh, in terms of the perception of that, it's it's important because I think that's where maybe a little bit of innovation or novelty will, will rely. Uh, in some cases, I think it has to do with the perception, not so much with the actual typology, but I could, probably I would characterize it as something more abstract, more like architects, let's say, like, you know, you know not like a... I mean, a museum is a museum, but it's not a, it's hard to actually characterize it as a typology somehow. So for me, I think what's important is to try and like create a little bit of undecidability, create a little bit of a sort of perception gap, uh, mystery in some way to actually 
maintain a certain distance between architecture and an experience of architecture. Talking about experience and perception, affect is an important aspect to your work. Would you say that you belong to the school of phenomenology? I mean, I think phenomenology is, an, is a kind of a loaded, you know, word in, in our field. And um, since the 90s, you know, all I've heard phenomenology is like a kind of phenomenology bashing, you know, from like the my teacher's generation, their teacher's generation. And I think my generation is sort of grown up to be a little bit cooler with phenomenology, not comfortable, you know, with it, uh, but a little bit cooler because you know, discussions about affect initiated by people like Chef Kidneys. And uh, I mean, I like to believe that we are not committed to the project of phenomenology because the way we work, the attention we pay to geometry, drawing, the rigor of, you know, of, of, uh, of, of projection, orthographic projection, uh, it goes above and beyond, you know, problems of phenomenology or just material or the effects of material. Uh, yet, you know, we are concerned, uh, since we are concerned with building and we are concerned with the effects of building, you know, we are concerned with that, you know, with that level of more like visceral experience, let's say. Uh, but I would say that's only a part of the work we do and never really just the, the entire thing. Well, talking about the controversy of that, we have a couple of questions that are dedicated to things that you've said in lectures that could be considered taboo. So it's art, philosophy, economics, and poetics. So we'll, we'll, we'll go through the questions now. You've said before that art, sculpture, buildings are all the same. Could you elaborate on why you don't have a distinction between them? Art, sculpture, and building? Yes. Wow, where did they say that? I think it was in Texas. <laughs> um... I mean, what I like believe is that that art, which is obviously part of culture, science, and architecture, meaning like, uh, or certainly all creative fields, uh, are sort of in an equal stand. Uh, you know, that they actually will be sort of in a more horizontal milieu where they, you know, the role of architecture is not to translate uh, art into a kind of build work. Uh, but it actually to generate its own ideas. In doing so, of course, we draw from art, as uh, art often draws from architecture in a different way. The responsibilities, the kind of the, the, the constitution of our, our field, uh, the service-oriented portion of it when it comes to a profession makes it kind of more complicated. So I do believe that, you know, that architecture is kind of, you know, it needs to feel more comfortable and architects need to feel more comfortable in their own field rather than bash and complain about the limitations of it and because it's just, you know, what it is. So, you know, we're not movie makers, we're not artists, we're not painters, you know, we're architects and, you know, and I, I think we should be kind of content with that. At that you know, maybe that's what I was trying to, uh, I, I was trying to mean, uh, but I can't remember exactly the context of the discussion. You find philosophy on materials interesting, or material philosophy. However, you don't believe that philosophy applies directly to building. What are your thoughts on philosophy's position within our discipline? I mean, I, don't know, I think philosophy has been like, uh, I find philosophy very, very important. I, I find philosophy as a kind of, you know, as main mission is a sort of building of concepts, building of ideas uh, that might be a little bit different than maybe some more contemporary understanding of philosophy as ideas of like, you know, can we create mystery in the world? Uh, but in that sense, you know, I think that philosophy has a lot to actually offer to architecture, you know, from like the idea of like what it means to actually dwell, to think, you know, to, to write, to conceive. Uh, so I find philosophy incredibly significant. Uh, having said that, I also find like like the sort of direct translations uh, of philosophy into architecture, you know, from like the, the Rydian models of the constructivism to the sort of the Lucian ideas of the fall, um, you know, or the uh, Rysom or smooth and striated. 
uh, which I was actually, you know, in school under that time, to maybe more sort of like recent ideas of, you know, of, uh, of the object are all super attractive, but I think, you know, we, I think architects just need to be a little bit more, uh, not careful, but, but need to actually understand that, that those, the, uh, that since philosophy, art and architecture live in a kind of world and they are all not subsidiary to each other, but they live in a kind of horizontal milieu, uh, direct translation will actually never really work. And, and we must find our own means of understanding problems. You know, of course, since philosophy actually makes the problems, we might take the problems from them, but we, I think we need to find, uh, you know, a home, a better sort of like, uh, um, framework for position and those problems in architecture. But I do believe by, by all means that, that philosophy is actually incredibly important to, to the world first and to architecture as one of the sort of creative fields and disciplines. The shift from hyperbolic surfaces in this office to surfaces produced with straight lines was due to economic concerns of building. To what extent do concerns like this affect your design approach? Uh, well, I like to disagree with the, the assessment. Um, the, the shift from like using, you know, hyperbolic, uh, paraboloids in, in buildings, it really had more to do with the shifting scale of the work or the interest in moving into larger scales where some of those, um, let's say some of those ideas either became too large and there where the economy, you know, becomes an issue. Uh, but not just economy that they are actually more expensive. It's just sort of the economy of thinking of buildings of how you even actually go, you know, to, to deal with these problems. Um, so, I mean, I think the significance of that shift, it's, uh, it, it really has to do with like, um, I really, I think it has to do with maybe the, you know, the preoccupations of, of, uh, of not being too, too categorical about um, about form or about geometry uh, and about the kind of work one does and, and try to, you know, without being too flexible either, to open up the possibility so you're not actually uh, pigeonhole into a corner, say like, well, you know, like you are the guys who actually do hyperbolic parabola or somebody that I remember like, you know, a friend that, you know, were discussing this problem and say like, when I told him that we weren't doing those things, you know, uh, anymore, not that we wouldn't do them again. I mean, we're still using sometimes less than before. He was like, Oh, but that was like, that was your move, you know? And I was like, well, that's no longer our move. I don't think it was ever our move anymore. I mean, you know, other people use it before and, and, and after. And so, I mean, we like to try and stay free of those kinds of constraints of like, you know, that would normally be assumed as purely stylistic. And to have a bit more sort of freedom, you know, to, to project, to, you know, to come up with like more appropriate responses to project and still maintain a kind of what we will constitute it, sort of arsenal, our arsenal of, of, of style, let's say, but in that sense, but be less narrow about it. And the final taboo question, um, in contemporary architecture, people are referred to as users and design processes seem to take people out of the equation. However, when you explain your projects, there is always a human aspect to approaching the building and interacting with the space. Is poetics of space important to you? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I mean, I come from Argentina. I, you know, the, 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 the culture of literature in Argentina, uh, from like, you know, Jorge Luis Borges, to Bioy Casares, to more recently somebody like Guillermo Martinez, uh, who's actually a kind of collaborator and, uh, you know, and somebody we sort of follow. It's really important. And none of those people wrote poetry too much, you know. I mean, poetry was something kind of around that. Uh, and I always had a little bit of a kind of uh, complication with the, with the overt uh, approach of, you know, uh, of poetics in architecture. I think that's maybe more of a back door than the actually front door. It means that I like to believe that once you actually make a building, the, the sort of poetics of space, the poetics of form, the plasticity of it, you know, the effects of light and shadow, 
in the shapes you make, one could make all sorts of, you know, uh, interjections and conclusions, and some of them could be actually pretty subjective in a way, uh, going toward the world of phenomenology. However, we never actually project solely based on them, therefore drawing, therefore orthographic projection. You know, I've said in the past, and remember keep me speaking up on this, that I will be willing to change a project uh, based on a sort of orthographic projection of the problem, and even if, if, if perspectival space will suffer from it. Because I do believe in it, that at the end, you know, we don't control perception as much as we would like to, and perception is likely to change. Whereas the physics of architecture, the metrics, the rhythms, the, you know, the materials and so on are obviously not going to change. Um, and for the next section... Because they were really taboo, huh? <laughs> Not that taboo. No. Still politically correct. Um, the next segment is <coughs> more according <coughs> to things you've been interested in, such as icons and yeah. the forthcoming book on new icons. Um, you said in a lecture, those who question icons don't understand architecture. What do you mean by that? I don't know where I said that, but maybe, okay. I'll, I'll, I mean, I, my, what I'm referring to, the, you know, the problem of icon is obviously a very kind of, uh, I mean, it's obviously a, both a belief on our part, um, and a, a reaction to a certain change in culture in the last decade, no? which is that I think culture has changed for a number of reasons, and, and the perception right now is that icons, meaning the idea of architecture that aims to produce something other than the reality around it, meaning context, is seen as somewhat uh, pervasive, as somewhat negative, as somewhat of, a, uh, of a waste, or, or, or an extra expenditure that, that, yeah, that society should not afford. And so to that kind of, uh, you know, sort of do-gooder, uh, idea of society, uh, that seems to prevent the, the production of icons. I say architecture is always being associated with the production of an icon. Now, the icon in itself as an idea, it's obviously a very elusive word because, you know, we make form, material, structure, but we don't make icons, you know, like in society, culture, make icons. So when I'm talking about icon, I'm talking really at the idea that hopefully if you actually believe that architecture is a sort of form of culture, um, architecture in some form, you know, with a capital A, with content, with a message, becomes iconic in some way, in some way, in some uh, examples more than others. So I do believe, and I am committed to the idea of the, of the continuation of the project of the icon in our own way. And this is where the kind of paradox begins, where you actually put the word mute beside icon, you find something that is, you know, in itself a kind of oxymoron, you know, and, and that's the kind of idea that I'd say, like, you know, the icon needed to be retuned, and fine tune to be to maintain its relevance, and I and the way we believe to do that, and of course the icon can take a certain you know many different forms, is that the icon has to be less of a kind of extroverted uh, thing, uh, less of a shock and awe and sensation making uh, piece, and maybe more introverted, more withdrawn, more uh, mysterious, and and in that way. You know, so sort of to delay the kind of apprehension, to delay the commodification even, and, and even to, you know, to kind of mix up and, and, and complicate uh, or strange the kind of feelings in and around it. The term new icon is very specific to you. Could you introduce us to it, like, as a summary of what's, what strengths does the new icon have and why is it important to introduce it to the discipline again? Well, I mean, one of the things we've been doing and this goes back to like, you know, um, what we think architecture is, you know, what the sort of history is to try and like, not only explain it with words, you know, explain it with like, with meaning, but also try and like to construct and retroactively a history of new icons in architecture, meaning to look at projects 
uh, from like you know the pyramids in in, in Egypt uh, through some sort of ruins in the middle of Saudi Arabia to churches in Ethiopia uh, to early projects by um, by Boulet and Ledux, you know, very well known in some cases, to some of the bin bunker bunkers of Virilio, uh, and obviously some some ideas pioneered by Corbusier and others, to look at projects that have been referred in many different ways, and uh, either as monolithic or as projects that actually are uh, built from the ground, or as projects that are actually engaging in autonomy, um, as sort of ideas of new icons, ideas of projects that have somehow uh, refuse uh, conditions of engagement in a more traditional way and, and still maintain a sense of architecture as a sort of push and vector of moving forward and yet have also produced this sort of weird paradox between something that is both engaging and something that is completely almost autonomous or withdrawn from that engagement. And, and so in that way we think, you know, we kind of potentially put our own project, our own interest, as not something that is completely new, because in that sense we don't believe in, in the new as a kind of a absolute in architecture, but more as a sort of evolution of, of ideas that exist, you know, somewhere between past and future. Uh, and also to begin to argue that that architecture has a sort of own history, and you could argue... Uh, uh, you could argue new ideas from the point of view of architecture as well. You know, of course, drawing from philosophical discussion, from discussion of the arts around it, but without needing to actually necessarily always go to them for legitimation or recognition, but rather understand that, that architecture has already built enough, built enough meaning like drawn enough, you know, projected enough, that you could actually get all those things. Some of these projects were not built, obviously. Some are drawing, some are building, some are, you know, demolished. What is the difference between an icon and a monument? Are all icons monuments and all monuments icons? I think that's a really good question. And I don't know if I will have it. You know, it's probably, I think, around the world and the use of the word icon, there's obviously a, a problem. And, and, and one, I think one should be more clear. I mean, I think clearly not all, uh, not all monuments are icons and not all icons are monuments. And I mean, I think... Uh, I think the icon brings with it the idea that culture has sort of decided collectively that something is an icon. Now, if you ask me today, you know, it's like so many hits in Instagram make something an icon. I don't know, you know, uh, like, you know, if something appeared in a movie, does it become an icon? You know, there's clearly cases of, I of buildings that are iconic. And they're architecturally completely insignificant. No, I mean LA is full of those things, you know, because of our sort of media-related culture, Hollywood, and so on. So, I mean, I think there clearly uh, the issue that when we are thinking of architecture as, you know, as as iconic, we're thinking of a certain scale of monumentality. So, of course, you know, you don't get to build a monument every every other year, uh, but if you think of a, you know, if you think of a housing project as potentially monumental or potentially delaying any kind of easy recognition of it as being housing, then you could start thinking like, well, you know, it's something that usually should explain itself so easily, it becomes so friendly for people to engage, aspire to a certain monumentality, and therefore it's not easy to understand or consume, then it could potentially become iconic in that sort of irritation that it produces in culture. and. I don't know, and therefore it kind of exists in time and in a space in somewhat of a, of a less clear sense. So that less clear uh, moment, it's something we're interested in. Whether it becomes an icon, I don't think we get to really say it. And monuments is obviously, you know, far beyond that. You have an interest in balconies. So on a less serious note, or a more serious note, yeah. can you describe your fascination with the balcony as an architectural element? I don't have an interest in balconies, you know, just to be clear. I think this has to do with, like, you know, having done at least two residential projects in Argentina, balconies are so pervasive and so kind of commonplace that that we did we did need to engage them. And, and they, 
you know, and they became in some cases sort of the issue of the of the project uh, because they because they are not necessarily the most relevant, but the most visual aspect of the of the project. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a whole lot of you know. It's like I'm not I'm not more interested in balconies than I'm not I'm interested in doors or stairs. You know, it's just like an element that at some point becomes like an important element. Let's talk about articulation and ornamentation. In a way, can we say that if you articulate something too much, you've started to ornament it? And what's your stance on ornamentation? Um, I mean, I've been in, I've never been particularly comfortable with the, the, the idea of ornament. Um, you know, even when like, you know, when we probably were kind of producing ornament, you know, uh, so, even when we actually, in 2003, when uh, when I did land tiles, which was a really early project, but it was a seminal project, uh, it was a kind of a landscape project, but it was probably one of the first projects that actually find a way of sort of partition a, a kind of a, a smooth surface uh, that was built. Uh, many projects follow, you know, including, you know, some of our friends' projects that they use similar techniques and so on. And I'm not that interested in like, you know, who was first and so on, but but whereas we were doing something particular, we never used the same technique to actually apply on, on buildings, you know, and and we were criticized for that. We were criticized for producing surfaces that were maybe too inarticulate, you know, and or lacking articulation at that and that relationship. And we always thought that that was that that it was just too easy to like, you know, because you could actually do something because you could articulate surface in a certain way, you must do it now. Now, we had incurred in some more or less levels of articulation in surfaces in different ways, punctuation or porosity and so on. And I, I think, I tend to think of ornament as something that you actually, it's added to architecture and, and articulation as something that somehow is sort of part of the trade of, let's say, Articulating a facade is it's it's also maybe resolving the relationship between interior and exterior of a, of a building. Let's say actually putting windows in a facade it might constitute articulation, uh, whereas ornamentation is something else. Let's say uh, of course one could actually begin to push those two ideas together, and maybe arguably in some cases we might have done it in the past. Uh, we are now. You know, certainly moving away from ornament, and and maybe my, are much more interested in what could maybe be considered a micro ornament or just texture, something that is like really much more off the material and off the surface, where you can you know you, you can never really take it out, you know, uh, not even like materially, but also conceptually. How do you define context, and how does one engage or disengage with it? <coughs> um, how do I define context? I mean, I think uh, I think context is really whatever um, you know, whatever is really around uh, the project, a project uh, both in space and time, meaning the politics, the culture, the geography, the economics. Uh, the finances, the codes, uh, the legislation, the mood around the project, that's really context and it's really, really important. Uh, and, and so we always try to be mindful of context. Uh, we always try to be, you know, uh, independent from context as well. And, and so we never just look at context and say, well, you know, what would be the response for us? But we also, but we also sort of pay attention to what actually, you know, what, like from the, our interest uh, in the abstract, let's say, from our sort of like ethos and our way of thinking, what would make the most sense, you know, and what would have the best chances to actually producing the, the, the most effect in that particular context. And often it's actually by opposition as well. You know, like, you know, you look at a context and, and, and understand like, 
you know, everything here works in a certain way. How do you actually like somehow fit in and differentiate yourself from that? You know, and I think that, which again, you know, brings the idea of dichotomy to many of the work we do, which is like sort of fitting in and standing out. It's really some of the things we try to do. You know, we don't try to just stand out and we don't try to just fit in. We try to actually do both at the same time, you know, with different, uh, different degrees of success and failure and, 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 and fine tuning of, you know, let's say the percentage of those two things. No? You refer to architecture as a feedback loop that constantly needs to be readjusted. And to end the interview, I'd like to ask, what shifts or readjustments are you making right now in the office? Uh, feedback loop sounds like a little too mechanical, but I probably have, may have said something like that. I mean, I think feedback is important because it actually kind of, you know, uh, gives you a sense of like where you're going. Uh, you know, like when you win something, it's important to win it. But when you lose it, Sometimes, you know, when you lose a competition, when you lose a project, you also put you in a kind of harder position because you need to reaffirm your ideas, you need to like re, re, you know, re, retune and make sure that you don't change your mind because you actually didn't get something, uh, but you also understand from those situations and reaffirm your ideas, but try and get, you know, better at them. Um, so, I mean, I think at this point we're you know, we're sort of pursuing, um, I mean, I think a line of work which is on a certain level very much, um, you know, on, on, in sync with this idea of new icons, uh, which is, you know, a book, a sort of a, a thing we've been working. On the other sense, it's much more kind of a, a speculative in terms of engaging uh, the condition that we find, we find in the ground. Um, as a necessary way of getting any sort of project off the ground. Um, it means like, you know, the challenging that we're trying to, you know, put to anyone working here is to actually to try to understand, to be really serious about the kind of commitment to, to understand the project, to understand what makes the project, to understand the context and the regulation and so on, the materials, you know, like that building in Indonesia, uh, in an island is very different than building in downtown LA in a, in a, in a tower uh, that doing a small project, you know, for a kind of, you know, for a sort of cultural foundation. So um, understanding that sort of gap, the differences, and still maintaining a kind of cohesion over the, the project, it's, it's probably our kind of, you know, main focus and, and, and challenge as well, you know, for everyone that works here. I've always appreciated our conversation, and I know you're extremely busy at the moment in the office, so I appreciate you taking the time to do this. No, this is fun. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it.